Okay, can, is this on? Okay, so we're going to start because um, we have a very short time. We have a lot of great distinguished panelists, and we have a lot to cover. So um, I hope the panelists are going to forgive me when I cut them off to keep it moving some. So, but first I need to give you guys a little bit of background. You probably mostly know, but it, a recorded piece of music has two copyrights one in the song and one in the recording. And that's important background for our conversation. So when you hear Aretha Franklin singing Respect on the radio, there's one copyright that goes to Otis Redding because he wrote that song. So Otis Redding and the publisher have that copyright. Aretha Franklin and the label have the copyright for the recording. Every single cover, other cover of Respect, Otis Redding and the publisher are still going to have the copyright in the composition, but the copyright in the recording version will be changing depending on who is doing that cover. So now I'm going to move into first one. We're only discussing the musical composition copyright, which is you know the song, the Otis Redding. So um, the musical composition copyright has a number, has an exclusive right for the public performance. For example, radio and television broadcasts. So. I can hardly see you guys, but raise your hand if you're songwriters. Okay, keep your hands up and raise your other hand if you're a member of a performance rights organization. Ask Epi and mine, CSA. Okay, every songwriter I see has two hands up. Um, and that's because traditionally the performance right organizations have licensed the performance right. Um, so, and they take the collections they get, they split it 50-50, 50% 50 -50, to the songwriters, and 50% to the, um, 50 to the songwriters, 50% to the publishers. Now last year, some of the major publishers decided they were gonna pull the digital rights from their works, from their catalogs, out of the PRO repertoires and license them directly. Um, so that's what they tried to do. They tried to go to Pandora to license those directly. Um, there was recently an ASCAP rate court decision that said, hey, you can't just pull out the digital rights for a work. You either have to leave the work in the, in the repertoire or pull the work out of the repertoire. You can't kind of have it half in and half out. Um, so we're unclear where the, pub where the major publishers will go now, whether they'll leave their works in the PRO repertoire or whether they will take their works out. So Hillel, he's on the end. Um, it, could you first give a brief introduction of yourself and then tell me why the publisher pulled their, right, their digital rights from the PROs? Sure. Uh, I'm Hillel Parnas. I'm a partner at Robbins, Kaplan, Miller, and Cerisi in New York. And I'm also on the adjunct faculty at Columbia Law School where I, I try to teach students about internet law and, and intellectual property. Um, 12 years in, I'm getting the hang of it. Um, so uh, not speaking here for ASCAP or for the publishers, um, but there's a lot of conventional wisdom out there about what happened. And the story doesn't start just with the pullout. The story goes back a number of years. Um, as Anne mentioned, um, uh, the performing rights societies collectively licensed works. Um, they are constrained by antitrust consent decrees entered into with the government, at least ASCAP and BMI are. And those have certain rules that we don't have enough time to go into today. But one of the main rules is if somebody asks you for a license, you have to give it. Um, and you negotiate it. And if you can't come to terms, the party that asked for the license is licensed. But you have to go to court to enforce that license, figure out how much it is. So um, all of disputes go to the same judge in the same court in New York. Uh, by way of example, the previous rate court judge was sitting for 35 years. The ASCAP rate court judge, Judge William Connor, was the ASCAP judge for 35 years until he died in 2009, uh, right in the middle of one of my cases, actually, <laughs> um, which was an in created an interesting dynamic for the new judge. Um, the new judge, judge, judge Denise Cote, has been in place since July 2009. Um, and um, conventional wisdom is that because of a number of the decisions that had come out of the rate court um, for ASCAP and also the rate court for BMI, um, in recent years, some publishers started thinking about pulling some of their rights back out of ASCAP so that they could try to essentially make more money or make money faster by licensing directly. Um, if you are licensing directly, you are not required 
to give a license the same way that ASCAP is required to give a license. And some would say you can have a uh, more meaningful, balanced negotiation um, with the licensor, um, and that's what they attempted to do. Thank you. Now, Gary, um, if you could tell everyone who you represent and what this would mean for your digital radio clients. So my name is Gary. Is this on? My name is Gary Greenstein. I'm a partner in the uh, Washington D.C. office of Wilson, Sincini, Goodrich, and Rosati. I'm also the former general counsel of Sound Exchange and worked at the RIAA. And for the last seven years, I represent a wide range of digital music and other types of digital media services. The withdrawal of a publisher's catalog or a partial withdrawal or even a complete withdrawal of a publisher's catalog from a PRO would, in many instances, complicate the licensing process in several ways. Number one, you would have an additional licensor to go and obtain rights from. So if you had to go to ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC initially, the three domestic PROs, performing rights organizations in the United States, to get probably anywhere between 95, 98% of all of the musical works here in the US, you would now have to additionally go not only to those three PROs, but to each individual publisher that had withdrawn rights. So you've got additional negotiations. Another complicating factor would be when licensing from a PRO, you would not necessarily know what you would be getting or what the price should be for that catalog or that repertoire. And although there's this concept of a license in effect, which means if you take a license out on a specific day, so October 28th, 2013, you should have the rights to all of the catalog licensable by that PRO as of that date. But what happens to new works that are created after that date by a publisher who was in the PRO as of the date you obtained your license, but withheld certain works because they can contribute works to a PRO on a case-by-case -case basis. So you could get part of Sony's catalog through ASCAP and or BMI, and then uh, for a new musical work that's been embodied in a sound recording, you may have to go to a, a music publisher directly. So that becomes complicated, figuring out the fees, and then the efficiencies in the market kind of dissipate as you have to go to more uh, licensors. And I think the issue from the licensee standpoint, the publishers like the benefits of collective licensing when it's to their benefit, and they don't like the burdens of collective licensing when they think that they can achieve something different in the marketplace, i.e. a higher rate. But they still want collective enforcement, collective administration. So if you're going to take some of it, I think what the court held is that you're either all in or you're all out. You're not going to get to cherry pick, and it's left to be determined whether or not that survives or whether or not the consent decrees may be modified. I know Hillel wants to respond. If you can keep it to 20 seconds, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. So, David, I have a question for you now. If you could, um, David represents a lot of um, terrestrial broadcasters. And so what would happen if the publishers do pull their catalogs completely, not just the digital rights, but their complete catalogs? What's that going to mean for your broadcaster clients? Well, you know, it's a real problem because um, there are a lot of small broadcasters out there that don't have the resources to negotiate. Um, it would have no idea where to go to negotiate with uh, separate labels. The beauty, as Jim has said in many times, of collective licensing is you've got one source to go to to get essentially I'm all the I'm sure music. when I ask Jim his question, that's what he's going to say, uh, too. I'm sure it is, too. <laughs> I don't even need to say it. Exactly. Uh, um, and and that's, that's the beauty of, of having one-stop shopping, is to be able to go to those organizations and get the rights to essentially the music that you need to run a, a music service, whether it be a radio station or a webcasting service. Now, do you envision um, a situation where generally, where when we have seen direct licensing, um, there have turned out to be exclusives? Do you see a, an environment where that arises, where if somebody's not in a PRO, for example, I have to turn to Clear Channel to hear the new, whatever, the new releases because they have an exclusive deal. And, you know, whereas NPR won't have that exclusive deal. Because we do see that in digital interactive services a lot. We see exclusives. You know, 
I'm not sure that on a um, one-off basis that that's a bad thing. Um, being able to directly license a limited number of songs or a, a catalog for an exclusive like that to give you a competitive advantage, um, you know, maybe that that's a, a, a something that, that the marketplace, that, that's pro-marketplace, in, in fact. You know, the difference between licensing a song for an exclusive digital service or radio uh, play or whatever, and licensing an entire catalog is one of power, is one of antitrust, almost. When you're licensing hundreds of thousands or millions of songs, where you have to get access to that entire catalog to run a music service, it's different than licensing one song or one album for a limited period of time for an exclusive. Okay, thank you. Now I'm going to turn to Eddie, who is a, you, you guys all, all know his music. He's a great songwriter. And if you could give a little bit of background about yourself and then tell us what would these direct licensing deals mean for songwriters? It's, it's now sad, Eddie, by the way. <laughs> for those who are here this morning. Um, uh, I've got very mixed feelings about direct licensing. I think there's, there's uh, I can understand uh, the, the, the problem in the United States, and it's a uniquely American problem, I think we should, we should say at the moment, because it, as a songwriter, you have non-exclusive assignment of your rights to the performing rights societies, all those who put up both hands, um, and for those who didn't, um, whereas virtually everywhere else in the world, the writers have exclusive assignments to the performing rights societies. The societies cannot, uh, the publishers, excuse me, cannot direct license the catalogs because you, you have a binding, as a writer, you've already assigned all those performing rights to the performing rights society in your country. So in Canada, so can PRS in Britain. We heard some of these, some of these names this morning. Um, you know, SSM in France, et cetera. Almost every country has usually one performing rights society. The United States is, is unusual in that regard. Um, so that option doesn't even exist outside of, of the United States, which adds another complicating factor. The reason I'm bringing it up is because the, the, the American-based publishers can license the Ameri their American-based catalog. Um, Otis Redding's works, because he's a U.S. writer, can be direct licensed by the publisher. Theoretically, my, my works cannot, because I'm directly assigned to SoCan. So that creates... Eddie's you know, Canadian. Canadian, that's right. <laughs> Although I live na in Nashville now. So that creates a whole other level of, compl another level of complexity. Mick Jagger, the Beatles, you know, the role, all, all of those in great English bands, they have exclusive assignments, for the most part, with their PROs. So it creates yet, creates yet another level of complexity um, in the situation. The, 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 the good news about direct licensing is, and, and uh, you know, some of my colleagues and friends who are publishers will tell you, it, and it's been mentioned, it gives them the, the, right, the, uh, the ability to negotiate around the consent decree, essentially, which is problematic. There's no question in my mind that now you've got three major publishers and three performing rights societies. It's kind of hard to understand why one operates under a consent decree and the other group don't because they're exactly the same number of large organizations, if you will. So that's kind of problematic. But for the, purely from the writer's standpoint, uh, I think the problems are things like transparency. Um, if you have direct licenses uh, between um, uh, digital services and publishers, uh, they don't, very often there's actually non-disclosure uh, agreements, which I mentioned this morning, which means the songwriters never actually find out what the fees were that were exchanged, how much uh, was actually uh, paid for the license. Um, advances are, are, are a key uh, point that I mentioned earlier. If, you, if the whole catalog is licensed very often, none of that money has to be shared with the music creators themselves. Um, you've got the issue of performing rights societies pay 50% of net uh, directly to songwriters and 50% of net directly to the music publishers. That means that even if you're unrecouped to your publisher, you will still get that 50 cents on the dollar uh, from the Performing Rights Society. And, and, and frankly, that, that's, that's, that, that makes a huge difference. So that money is not, there's not that one other intermediary uh, in the process is taken out of the process for that particular revenue stream. I mean, to give you an example, uh, years ago, I had a dispute with one of my publishers. They just cut off all of my funds. They wouldn't pay me. Um, I think it was totally unjust, and eventually they did pay me. But for that period of time, if, if, if the performing rights stream 
had not been independent, I wouldn't have been able to support myself. So the fact that I had that other independent source of revenue was critical to my being able to survive and keep writing songs and making music, uh, not having to go work at Walmart. Which Thank I, you. Which I appreciated at the time. And so do so, we all, because you, <laughs> you wrote songs that made us better. I would be terrible, yeah, ter terrible. <laughs> Save the world by not directing. So, <laughs> and now, Hillel, <laughs> Hillel, I'm going to go back to you. You, can, yeah. you have 20 seconds to answer Gary's question, and then I'm going to ask you um, what you think direct licensing means for because you told us before basically from the major publisher's point of view, but what it means for the, both the performing rights organizations and also for independent publishers, the small publishers. Sure, so th just one point I wanted to make uh, before is that I've heard a lot of people um, who occupy a similar place in the market as, as Gary and Gary's clients, who especially before the publishers started taking out some of their rights, would sit, sit at panels like this and complain about ASCAP and BMI and how hard they were to deal with and how difficult it was and, we wish, there was, we, wish, <laughs> right, we, wish, we wish there was a better way. Um, and in fact, um, licensees have tried different ways before. One of the key examples is DMX. DMX actually had a very successful direct licensing program before any of this happened. And ASCAP, through the rate court process, was required to give credit, uh, a lot of credit, to DMX for having done that. Uh, which then reduced the licenses that ASCAP and BMI were able to charge as a result. I, I think some of the songwriters feel a little differently on some of the DMX issues. Yeah, I mean, I think DMX, I, I don't know how successful DMX was. It, it, it dramatically re ended up reducing the amount of money that, that uh, was generated by those uses. Uh, it was not totally untransparent. There were, there were, I think their non-disclosure agreements were involved. And uh, the information that eventually did come to light only became to light because of the lawsuit. No, no, let me, let me be clear. Um, so, first of all, I, I represent ASCAP. But second of all, <laughs> not in that case. Third of all, um, no, I don't think DMX was correctly decided. What I'm saying is, um, if you read the court opinion, it was the 850 direct licenses DMX had done that convinced the court that those became the benchmark instead of what uh, the PRO licenses were. Um, again, disagreeing with the outcome, but DMX would certainly say that oh, they, they pulled it off from their point of view. Yeah. Right. Right. Sorry. The one thing I want to add to that is people talk about the major publishers, Sony ATV, for example, or EMI, wanting to pull out because they believe they can get a higher rate. And that may, you know, maybe that is, maybe it's not true. But to believe that some publishers will be able to pull out, and if you look at the changes to the ASCAP, uh, compendium rules, which are essentially the bylaws with, uh, within which publishers participate in ASCAP, it was frictionless. They could pull out, they could negotiate a deal, achieve a higher rate if, if they were successful in doing that, and then they could immediately come back in and have all of their licenses administered by ASCAP. But if you really are talking about market competition, if some of the major publishers pull out and get a higher rate, what are licensees going to be willing to pay for all of the small publishers. If they were paying three and a half, five percent of their gross revenue for publishing rights and a publisher increases their rate to eight percent, do you think all of those small publishers with a couple of you know, small catalogs are going to continue to be able to get the same rate they were getting through ASCAP or the higher rate that the withdrawn publisher was able to get? Or in fact, should they be subject to a market negotiation which says, you know what, you're now at one percent because I can do without your content and I'm only willing to pay you a certain price? And Jim, this is going to lead me to my final question to you. My final question on this subject here. What is the impact of the, uh, what would the impact of direct licensing be on the entire music ecosystem? A small question. Small question. <laughs> and you have 30 seconds. Well, no. Axel Dache, you know, at, at, I think it's Deezer said that fragmentation is cancer. You know, that, and, and I do think that's appropriate. I think it's right. I think it's for David's clients and Eddie's members. I think they're both nodding their heads and pointing out that both sides of the market, whether you're a buyer or a seller, feel it's cancer, that it would be the equivalent of getting a terminal disease. Now, you know, my own sense of it is to suggest, just as a modest proposal, and really just in fun, that we've got to emulate sports and bring on a draft for musicians. <laughs> I think that we've got to draft them into publishing societies and into contracts and things because sports, which is our big competition in the marketplace, they go after time on the clock, money in the wallet, and they don't have these problems with content. They just conscript it. 
and they do it with their unions. They've got a labor agreement, it's totally legal. They say this is the team you've got to play with and we should say this is the label you've got to play with, this is the publisher you've got to play with. And if we don't get our way, we threaten to, dis uh, to disband the union, which is exactly what's happening in sports. Without the union, they can't have the draft, so the players have a great deal of power. The problem is that we are getting so fragmented that we're not working together. And the reason I say this about sports isn't so much in jest. It is to say that they work together. They share revenues across teams. They, they, they work together in ways that enable them to deal with changes in the marketplace that aren't that dissimilar to our own. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that they were saying, oh, if you can broadcast that on television and it feels like free, no one will buy a ticket to go to the stadium. Uh, there's been any of a number of intersections with piracy that they've faced. But Jim, just, just mm -hmm. one point on that is the sharing revenues and things. That's football, and a lot of people will say that's why the football teams are all better to compete with each other because it's not in baseball, and that's why you have the wide disparity well, with the Yankees being able to outspend other teams. But baseball has its own system as well. And furthermore, it was John Kennedy in 1961 that signed the Sports Marketing Act that allowed baseball, basketball, football, and hockey to combine their operations for the purposes of marketing. I mean, there's a reason why a single referee on the field can't hold up the television contract, or why none of the players are able to do that either. It's because they all work together to get as much money as they can out of your wallet. And we've got to do the same thing. We have to work together, which is one of those things they teach you in kindergarten, to deal with sharing, <laughs> which is the other thing they teach you in kindergarten. And yet both of them are illegal. The Thank antitrust department will come down. It, who was the musician in England? It was a great musician named Screaming Lord Such who said, why is there only one antitrust department? And that's probably a, that's, <laughs> it's Thank, probably a good question, I think. Okay. That is at the essence of all of this. <laughs> and, and Jim, I'm going to get back to the same yeah. question again for you, probably, um, because... Actually, and before we go on, not yeah. to challenge Jim, but to turn to Eddie. I mean, Eddie, maybe I'm naive, but why in your publishing deals as a songwriter, when you're signing your rights to your publisher, do you allow for um, deals to be done without transparency? so that you can't find out what the publisher has done with your works when licensing it to the services or others? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I, I signed my first publishing deal, I, I, I don't know if I was 17 or 18 years old, David, and I think the answer is that you, you, you're just told to sign. You have absolutely no bargaining power, no negotiating power. You, the, you, the lawyer, uh, in my case, my lawyer turned, was appointed by the guy who signed me, who I thought was my lawyer, who then yes, turned out to be... Yeah. Well, let's hope you were 17. Uh, any, help you, <laughs> any help you guys can give me, I would really appreciate. But uh, it, it turned, and then the, the gentleman who I thought was my lawyer, I signed it, and he said, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, I'm the vice president of the company you just signed with. <laughs> so, I don't know, I mean, that's obviously, you know, uh, anecdotal, but I think, I don't think it's really that far off. You get a lot of young kids who sign, uh, you know, who, who sign away works that end up being worth you know, a lot of money and, and ha become significant and they do it at a time in their life when they have no negotiating power and it's all standard and the other word thing you keep hearing is, well, that's standard. That's a standard contract. Or, that's a standard clause, excuse me. You can't change that. Oh, that's a standard clause. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know if the, you know, I'd like to see better legal representation for Maybe kids early in there. where the regulation needs to be. Well, yeah, um, a new project for FMC, too. Yeah. It, it's or, or fair trade the songwriters guild and the fair trade music project because I think Eddie's started to take Jim's point let's all work on it together that, yes well, I, yeah, I just gotta say really quickly that it's an antitrust is huge in this and we're not bringing yeah. it up but that's why there are the consent decrees and it's why I wonder because I throw this question back to you attorneys and by the way if you're looking to throw something it's attorney non-attorney attorney, attorney, <laughs> non -attorney, attorney. <laughs> but I gotta ask you how it is that somebody who's got a significant percentage of the market, let's say 25% or more, pulls out of a society and thinks it's not entitled to a consent decree too. Yeah. In other words, how is it that Universal and Sony and Warners don't end up with a consent decree even if they pull out? Because their market share is so great that yeah. it's close to the market share or beyond it that triggers an investigation. Well, I wouldn't be, so, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw 
antitrust actions if that happens. Right. So, and that was well, the no. point I was trying to make earlier, not mm -hmm. as eloquently as Jim, obviously. No, I, and I think we're on the same. So now I'm going to switch. I'm sorry, another question you could ask, though, is also why ASCAP is under a 1941 amended, but a 1941 consent decree that doesn't have a sunset clause in it that's still around. But it's been amended. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to switch well, just from... Say, I, I just want to say before we go past that, that I agree with you. And that's really the point of my remarks is that I'm okay with combinations as long as they make it faster, easier, and simpler to pay in hopes that when it is, more people will. Um, you know, I think that's the crazy thing is that we even have three of them. And I say that because you can imagine that you're a restaurant owner who gets visited by ASCAP and then BMI, and then you want to hit the guy from CSAC because you think, <laughs> didn't I already pay this bill? And at some point you say, my God, let them work together like sports does to do the best they can for themselves and make it as fast and easy and simple as it can be. Okay, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to move on because we, we have uh, two more things to discuss. So now we're going to move from the musical composition to the sound recording copyright. So remember at the beginning I talked about two copyrights, musical composition, now we're switching to the recording. Now, in the U.S., unlike the composition, the sound recording performance right is li limited to digital performances. Terrestrial radio is exempt. So this discussion here, we're going to focus on non-interactive performances yeah, they're on... They're only exempt when they're broadcasting terrestrially. Right, same yes, signal yes. sent over the satellite or over yes, the net is, is Yes, it's only the terrestrial broadcast that's exempt. So now we're, this conversation is going to focus on the non-interactive performances on services like Pandora or Sirius XM and on radio simulcasts, as Jim just said. So unlike the musical composition, the sound rep recording performance right is not an exclusive license, okay? It is a statutory right, and that means that recordings can't be withheld from the services in an attempt to get a higher rate. So here, we're going to do this exercise again. Raise your hand if you're a performer. Okay, keep those hands up. Raise your hand if you've registered with Sound Exchange. Okay, most of you have, but not everybody. Performers who haven't, you should. Um, but like ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, do the performance right licensing for the composition, Sound Exchange collects the money that's paid pursuant to this statutory license for um, the performance of the recordings. It is split 50-50 with the artists, and the artists get paid directly. Now, here again, we see that the labels have, again, have, tried, have begun to enter direct deals with the users. But unlike the music publishers, Hillel told you the music publishers have an exclusive right, so they were pulling in an attempt to get a higher rate. Well, these deals can't get a higher rate. They're actually for, from what I've read, for less than the statutory rate would be. So um, my first questions are for Gary and David. Um, why do you think, because you represent these, the labels are doing this? I think it's very clear why, if you're a label, you would want to direct license someone. As Ann just pointed out, if a licensee is operating a statutorily eligible service and can pay royalties to Sound Exchange, the rate is fixed and they don't worry about it. They just pay Sound Exchange and the money is split 50 50. If you are a label licensor and you can license that service directly, then you get the money and according to statute, you allocate the receipts that you have pursuant to contract, which means you can recoup if you've paid an advance to an artist and they are unrecouped. And you can do lots of different things as to how you allocate advances, data fees, non-transmission fees that you get the service to pay you. So let's say you're a late, let's say the service pays $100, $50, or let's say $10 comes off the top for sound exchange overhead, which is high. Sound exchange is probably half of that. But there's $90 left, 45 would go to the label. What happens if the label says to a digital service, you know what, I was only getting $45 out of the 100 you paid, you pay me 95, you get a little bit of a break and I get to keep all of that. Sounds like a great deal for the licensee, it sounds like a very good deal for the label, not such a great deal for the artist, but if Although you believe you in free contract and 
what labels do or what Eddie did, then that may be the operation of the marketplace. Although you have seen that all the majors who have done this, the, the, or the few majors that have done this, when it's a major deal, 50% goes directly from the licensee to sound exchange to go to the artist. As far as you know. Right, but it's not going through the label, so it is going as from far, the licensee. As far as you know, and let's yes. just say that the market is not necessarily constrained by that belief, and there could be lots of things that are done pursuant to a direct deal that would take that money completely out of having it subject to a 50-50 split. So Bruce, um, Bruce is a performer, and give us a little bit of background about yourself, and then tell us what these direct deals mean for the performers. Well, I'm a pedal steel guitar player by trade, um, but I'm the Vice President of the International Recording Musicians Association, which is a player conference within the AFM. And I'm also on the AFM AFTRA, SAG AFTRA board, which distributes sound exchange money to non-featured artists, which are the background singers and session musicians. And I've been a session musician um, for 30 years, and we have never, until now, gotten performance money. We don't get royalties. I can go in and play on a hit record, and I get paid my union scale, and that's it. And that record could sell 10 million records, and I don't make any extra money, even if it's my intro that's on the record, and it's my key part. So the greatest thing that happened when Sound Exchange was formed is the background musicians got 10% of that artist share. So the, uh, the featured artists got 90%, and the non-featured singers and session musicians got 10%. So it's working. Uh, the downside is we don't have a terrestrial right yet. The rest of the world has a terrestrial right, and um, we don't have a performance right for regular radio, but we're making a lot of money right now. I think Sound Exchange got you know, half a billion dollars this year, give or take, and I know that we're distributing uh, $16 million to session musicians. The danger, if Clear Channel and these companies start going in, these broadcasters go in, and they start making these direct deals. It's, it's it, exactly what Gary was saying, is, you know, they're gonna cheat. If they don't have a, if, if there's not a statutory rate, they're gonna cheat on this stuff. There's no way that they're gonna, uh, that they're eventually, if they get enough major labels buying into this little plan, then the whole sound exchange thing is going to fall apart, and artists and uh, musicians in this country are going to be left out in the cold. And when you look at the rest of the world, the rest of the industrialized world has a performance right for artists and musicians. And I, I'm just going to class. I'm going to put musicians and singers in the same category with artists. So we'll just call them all artists. So I think we have to be aware of this. I think. These, uh, these big uh, broadcasters, especially, Clear Channel is the one who's making these deals. They made a direct deal with Big Machine, they made a deal with Warner Brothers. They're doing a workaround because they do not want to have, um, uh, you know, they, they want to figure out, they're, they're realizing everything's starting to go digital. They're gonna have to be paying more money. They're trying to cover their asses right now. And, do a workaround and keep the government from being involved. And if they can make enough private deals and say, hey, this is a free marketplace, at some point, if everybody buys into that, eventually they'll pull a Walmart deal and they'll go back and they'll say, well, yeah, we paid you this last year, but this year we're gonna pay you less. And in the meantime, artists keep losing. Okay, so you brought up, um, an, um, you brought up an important point, which was about the terrestrial broadcast right um, for sound recordings. The U.S. is one of the very few countries in the world where the sound recording does not have a performance right over terrestrial radio. Those of you that have been here since the morning, you heard Shara Perlmutter talk about how that was a recommendation in the Green Paper, and Jacqueline Charlesworth talked about how the Copyright Office has been recommending that as well, that the U.S have a terrestrial right for sound recordings. So the US performers lose millions of dollars that are collected overseas, and terrestrial radio is given a competitive advantage over the other services that do have to pay. So I want all of you guys to chime in on whether you think the US um, should have a uh, terrestrial performance right for sound recordings. And you've already chimed in, yes. Gary? I'll let Halal start. 
Uh, I, <laughs> Uh, well, I was going to say that um, the Pandoras of the world, while arguing for equality, would not want to see that right added because they're trying to get rid of they're trying to get rid of the payments that they feel are additional at this point. I think Pandora may be on the record as supporting a terrestrial performance right. Sure, it's a level playing field. Yeah, but I don't know that they are. Yeah, I can't speak I, I don't know if they I are think or not, they but have I, been I think, in the past. But, but, but Pandora's drive has been Somebody too, said they are. They have. Okay. Yeah. Maybe they don't think it's realistic. Look, that's the tough question for all of us. I mean, we confront this. We look at it. We say AM, FM radio, they pay nothing. We look at satellite. They have one rate. There's a different rate for the net. And it begins to feel like this town, Washington, D.C., gets to pick the winners and the losers in the media market by assigning rates to them. And that is a tough thing to want, to want the government to decide the media that you enjoy by assigning rates to them that are wildly different in each case. I mean, so wildly that I think Pandora, we would agree, pays somewhere near three quarters, 70 percent, uh, well over half of their revenues, right? We would agree that Satellite, I think, is paying 15 percent, roughly, uh, would you say, 15, uh, su sub 15. Uh, and you've got the net where, of course, that's where uh, Pandora resides. And then you've got pre-existing pre services paying a different rate still. And that's all over the map. That's everything from zero to 70 percent. And you did hear this morning, those of you who were here, when Shira talked about um, the green paper, they are asking for comments because they did recommend that there should be some kind of rationale to the um, rate setting procedures. And um, so those of you who have comments, please make sure to file them. And let me just add, those, that's for the same content. You could have an AM FM station that had its signal on satellite, could also put it on the net. The exact same signal pays everywhere from zero to 70%. Zero to what? 70. I, 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 Actually, it would be over 100% if the CRB rates were in effect for Pandora. Okay. So, so, I mean, that's quite a wildly divergent rate set. I think we'd all agree. <laughs> in some of the early, um, you know, the fair trade music thing I was talking about this morning, we've done some um, research, and there's a, a gentleman by the name of Jeffrey Eisenach who, who did a, re a report on Pandora and what they pay for music. I think it was 65%. <clears throat> compared to capital goods in almost in every other industry, that's either comparable or the low end of the scale. I mean, almost anybody who buys something to resell to somebody else pays more than 65%. But let's be fair. <clears throat> up to, up to Dr. Eisenach is an RIAA sound exchange, <clears throat> I believe, recurring witness. So just, it, that may be one study. So you're saying he's, I, he's, a, he's impartial as well. I, I would say that there are lots of economists on both sides of this debate okay. and lots of the economists. And, but one different. other thing I think that you can look at, because um, Jim was talking numbers, percentage, what somebody is paying. But if you look at, per, for example, the per user rate, it, it, it's directly different to that because some have better business models than other. So XM series actually pay a higher per subscriber rate than does Pandora because they have a different business model. So that all is part of the equation as well. It's because their business model is a subscription model. And if you're looking at a free model, I think one of the things that all the digital music services have found is that they can't make money on the free model at the rates that they're currently doing. So if you want free music in the marketplace, you've got to come to uh, uh, some sort of deal on the rates. Yeah, or let's agree it's never free. It, should, it could feel free, but we're not right. here well, arguing for free right. music. It, it, it's it's non-subscription to the listeners. Not, but then it's right. advertising. Right, right. so right. Pandora right. could have more ads. non-subscription, but I think it's important but, to point out that Congress, in its infinite wisdom, whatever else you think about Congress, they established in the statute that there would be a category of service called eligible non-subscription transmission service. And you've got to believe that if Congress created that category where they recognized that consumers would not have to pay, it was congressional intent for the American people to have access to music over the Internet without having to pay directly for it. Indirectly, they pay through accepting advertising. Right. But I think it's a, Dave's point is an excellent point in that if you intend for there to be non-subscription services at the rates of 60 or 70 percent or over 120 percent, which is what the CRB rates are, you do not have a sustainable business. And if you're the biggest webcaster in the industry and you cannot build a business on the rates that are established by the tribunal, which is supposed to establish 
willing buyer, willing seller rates, I think you've got a problem with the entire system. Well, okay, and and we, we I, want them. I actually think that's very important for musicians here in the audience because I think you want free music to be out there for people to listen without paying subscriptions. You know, all of us here in, in this room are probably paying subscriptions for music. We like music, but I don't think the entire population is the same um, as those of us in this room. A lot of people, yeah, sure, they, they like music when they can get it, when they can turn on the radio, when they can uh, tune into Pandora, they like it for free, but they're not willing to pay but, for it. Right, but, but maybe, and I'm just saying, maybe Pandora sh you know, should add one other, an, an additional ad per hour, and then the rates aren't as high a percentage. You don't think they would do that if they could? They'd I, be making more well, money. Well, actually, I mean, I, I saw the numbers when Pandora put a cap on the free listening and then you had to subscribe and they were getting really high um, rates of people subscribing and then for some reason I don't know what, it was high. And then they just stopped, they took off that cap. But I want to move on to, uh, Eddie, yes. Um, I just want to praise the uh, U.S. copyright law for a moment. It's taken a beating uh, for most of the day, but... Um, Recapture rights, I just want to mention that, and, and because it intersects with everything we're talking about, and it applies both to the artists and to the songwriters. So it's, it's a, a feature of US copyright law. After 35 years from publication, the, the, the copyright in both the, the, the work, as Anne described it, the song, and in the performance of the work, the recording, both can uh, both return to the original artist. There are some artists and songwriter. There are some, some quirks to it, but basically that's the case. And I just want to say that, and it also goes to David's question, is that, is that in this country, and I think this country alone, or, or, or in Europe there are some weird little recapture things, but basically the U.S. is the only country in the world that lets you walk, you know, knock up to the, walk up to the door of your publisher or your record label 35 years later and say, you know what, I, I think I made a mistake 35 years ago. Um, would you mind if I just took that copyright back now? Yeah, so the one so, rule is 25 <clears throat> years after... You created something. Call a lawyer. <laughs> that's right. You have you have a you have a ten year. That's right. Call Saul. You, you, you have a you have a. You, you gotta call Saul. You, I'd like you, to you get. You can do it no sooner than ten years. Jim, it's better call Saul. Well, better, call better, Saul. better call Saul. Okay, okay sorry, Bruce. Before before we Bruce move on, person. I just I just want to say one thing. Talking about the the broadcasts, uh, talking about performance rights. The elephant in the room is we deregulated radio in the late nineties which put control of the radio market in the hands of a very small amount of corporations. These are the same people that own all these webcasters. These are not hurting. The reason these people want to go around and do all these workarounds is because they want to avoid being accountable on their big money. And they're making these deals, they're doing these workaround deals, and they're giving exclusive promotional consideration to these record companies. Payola is alive and well in the radio business, and if we don't get a law against these things, we're going to be screwed. Okay, so my final question here for each of you is, if you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about music licensing, what would it be? And each of you has a magic wand. I just want re-argument on one or two cases I had in front of Judge Cote uh, for ASCAP. <laughs> Eddie? Wow. <clears throat> um, I think this transparency issue is, is just, for me, it comes, rises to the top. There's a lot of issues, obviously. It's a hard, it's a hard question. But I think transparency, I mean, knowing, li lifting the lid off of a lot of what's going on, I think would be very, very helpful to all parties concerned. Letting some antiseptic sunshine into a lot of the deals as Gary was talking about. Uh, there's a lot of that going on right now. DMX, the case, there was certainly a lot of stuff that we don't know. We wouldn't have known for sure if there wasn't a lawsuit. But um, I, I just think letting the sunshine in on a lot of this stuff would be very, very helpful. David? I think the rules need to be written so that everybody can understand what they are whether it be the broadcasters or digital music services that I represent or the, the artists and songwriters. Right now, it's so complicated that I, I think Gary and I, uh, and Hello probably don't understand it, and we're supposed to be the experts, or at least the lawyers on the panel. Um, it's gotta be simplified. Jim? Look, I, I think for, and you're asking about licensing generally, right? 
Yes, if you could, music yeah. licensing. Right, and, and look, I think in order to have a sustainable economy of ideas and their expression, and that goes for music obviously, but other things as well, we have to record and enumerate a globally unique identifier for each of these songs and for the sound recordings that, they, that are involved with them. And I say that because you could not have a sustainable economy of vehicles without a VIN number, without some kind of vehicle identification number. You would not have an economy in real estate without the recordation and enumeration of real estate plots. And it is almost bizarre that we call it property but refuse to register it. And, and so the, the problem is, is that the flow of money from the user uh, to the creator is interrupted by actual interpretation. I mean, it's bizarre. So hit me with your best shot, which is arguably one of your best shots, has to match syntactically. And then we expect that to happen in China and the BRICS countries too without a number. And I mean, it's just bizarre to think that we're going to have a global economy in music without some globally unique identifier and some recordation and enumeration of those. And I tell you, if we do that, the black box shrinks. And if we don't, the black box grows. And that's as simple as it is. And if you like black boxes, then you want it to be sloppy and you don't want there to be any kind of recordation enumeration. But if you're for getting money to creators as quickly as possible, then you'll put a globally unique identifier on it, you'll have everybody register for it, and you'll have people use those in commerce. So that's what why and, I would And win. Jim, what time is the metadata panel this afternoon? There is a metadata panel and it follows this one and it's in this room. So. Okay, so everybody stay for the metadata panel because it's gonna dive deeper into those issues that Jim just brought up. So I actually, I don't disagree entirely with Jim, but I don't think that's the root problem here. I think there are, there are many issues. You've got things such as statutory damages that give copyright owners a big club, duration of copyright, which I think is far too long. I think if you're talking about transparency, and I think transparency and data go together, but you really want simplification of licensing. You want broad licensing, and then you want uh, sunshine to be looked at those people who are collecting the money to make sure it goes to the parties who are entitled to that money. I think if you broadened the licensing and you did not allow copyright owners to punish people in a manner that was discriminatory, and you enabled the artists and creators to be able to get accountings from their labels, from their publishers, did not have to spend inordinate amounts of money to conduct audits, you would actually have new business models that would germinate, that would be able to thrive, would compete in the market, and the better products in terms of better as in which uh, products do the consumers use, you would increase the amount of money and increase the flow of that money. And Bruce? From an artistic point of view, from the artist side, we need a level playing field. There's no way that we can compete with the money that the broadcast lobby throws at Congress and, and with the fear that is instilled in our artists to speak out about this thing because they won't get played on the radio. If a major artist comes out and says he's for performance rights and he goes against the broadcast lobby, he doesn't get paid. That's crazy. Sheryl Crow is getting played on the radio all the time. And she's That's spoken an out in favor I mean, of a performance right. I, I would, I, I'd say that most artists are very scared to take a stand. And I think Eddie might be able to back me up on that from Nashville, or maybe not. I don't mean to throw you under the, under the thing. But I think a lot of artists don't want to don't risk their careers by going in front of Congress and testifying that we need a level playing field and we need fairness and equity in this uh, situation. Although I, I must say that if you're talking about artists are afraid of getting played on radio and then you're simultaneously calling for a performance right, which is it? The US arguably has the most dynamic, thriving music or recorded music uh, industry in the world. We don't have a terrestrial performance right, but I'm not sure people could say that over the last 40 or 50 years that the US music marketplace has not been thriving, notwithstanding the decline from the peak in 99 through today, which could be for other reasons, but you know, it, it's easy to bash radio and say that we're, that the U.S. is in the same company as I've heard North Korea, Cuba, Iraq, whatever. I think Cuba may have a performance. Okay. Right. But, you know, if you look at it, there are a lot of people who have done very well. There are a lot of artists and a lot of labels who have done very well with the current system. If people don't like what's happened on the long tail, 
Maybe that's an issue with the labels and the recoupment and how recoupment works, which it's not as though the labels didn't make money. They have made money. They're just accounting. What about the old artists? Way. What about the old artists that are having to, you know, that their, their music's being played all the time and don't get a dime? I mean, what about, you know? I mean, a few people have done well, but I'm just saying, and you misunderstood me, I'm saying that modern artists aren't going to go out and, and jump on our side and say, hey, man, we need a performance right. They're not going to get out there and go to Congress and, and politicize. Many of them have. Many, sound Exchange not, has taken out articles, and there's, I mean, you know, there's a I, lot I, going on, and I, I'm not sure that there's a lot of silencing of people, but I, I could be wrong. Okay, um, I've had the... Yeah, but I know Halal wanted to say one thing. Yeah. I was hoping there was time for people to ask questions because yeah. there were... Do we have time? Because we were told that there, there's a little bit of time lag. So if any of you guys have questions. While they're doing it, let me ask you a quick question. Why is it that everybody wants an individual deal in an industry that's awash in MFN clauses? <laughs> I mean, if everybody's got a most favored nations clause, then why do they think they can get a better deal? Yeah, but that's what happens, is my point, is that we really are blanket licensing, whether they fragment or not, so why fragment? So the yeah. yeah. There are ways to track okay, so MFNs. Well, Counselor, I, I, I'm sure you're right. Why don't you <laughs> ask your question? Yeah, two things. Number one, um, Jim, I, I know your analogy between the music industry and the sports industry was somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but one Only of the... Somewhat. Yeah, <laughs> but one of the differences is that the sports leagues control the channel. If you want to go to a football game, you have to go to the stadium or you have to turn on the station that was licensed to broadcast the game. In the music industry, it's the wild, wild west has been saying all day. They can get the music from everywhere, so that's one difference. But I want to hear someone, particularly someone close to the radio industry, there is a particular radio network who I will, whose name I will not mention because a lot of you probably know who it is. The owner of that network actually use her airtime to basically broadcast propaganda against performance royalties, saying that it would destroy small radio, and she was telling one side of the story, and it was very skewed, and it was making people believe that this was something that was bad for radio, particularly small uh, urban radio stations in particular, and it, it, it was completely skewed and biased, and she got away with it, and as far as I know, she's still doing it. I stopped listening to her radio stations, so I want to hear someone chime in on that, because the deck is definitely stacked in favor of the uh, radio conglomerates and against the artists. Some people know the cost of everything and the value of nothing. And so, of course, they are going to speak out against paying for music. But it should be seen as, as just as short-sighted as it is. I mean, you know, you get what you pay for ultimately in this world, and I challenge anybody to really disprove that. And if we discredit music and don't pay for it, we're not going to get much more of it. Yeah, and, and I think more to your example, don't piss on my leg and tell me it's raining. You know, <laughs> Kathy Hughes was doing just that, and that's just who you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know which way this thing goes, but one thing that, that has hurt uh, people in the town where I am, in Cleveland, is a lot of club owners have stopped having live music because of royalty rates. And the royalty rates are there to help the musicians, which I'm all for, and I'm, I'm one of them, but when a club owner comes up to you and says, you know what, You're, nobody's allowed to play any cover tunes because I just got shut down, they were in here. And I understand on the mass scale where you have a restaurant or, or a nightclub that has several thousand people, but there are venues out there where they hire, have 60 people eating dinner, they're getting hit by ASCAP and BMI, and they just say, I don't want to deal with the paperwork, I don't want to deal with this, we're going to play uh, music, and we lose out. I represent an organization called the Farmers Market Coalition, which are farmers markets throughout the United States and trying to negotiate agreements with the three PROs. And the PROs approach farmers markets by giving them a shopping center license, treating them the equivalent of a mall that may be open seven days a week, 12, 14 hours a day, to a market that's probably seasonal, maybe open 26 weeks a year, four to six hours one day a week. And uh, I mean, I hope to be able to make progress with the PROs. We're still talking and, and hopeful about that, but I share your pain and concern about the fact that the demands for the rates may be out of whack with 
what is appropriate in certain circumstances. And certainly in the case of farmers markets, I think there's a pretty big disconnect right now. Yeah, but I mean, b more to the point, you know, the famous case, it, it happens uh, a long time ago in Paris on the Champs-Élysées at the Ambassador's Restaurant. Bourget, the famous composer, goes to eat with the Victor Perizot. He hears the orchestra play his music, and he leaves without paying for his meal. He says, why are you playing my music when in charging me for the food? Yeah. And of course, he ends up in court, and the judge says, you've got to pay for the meal. But he turns to the restaurant and says, and you've got to start paying for the music. And this is a seminal decision. It happens at the, as an extension of a law in Paris that ironically says you can't read a book aloud in public without a license. Henri de Balzac and Victor Hugo had it passed. So they formed the world's first author society, which is now Sassem. And so we have to remember our roots, that these are the things that got us where we are, that we even can talk about making a living. So while I have great sympathy, I also feel that the adjustment is one of rate, not letting them go. And so you're right, but we're always going to have excesses in an adversarial system. Someone's going to ask for too much, someone else is going to say it should be less, but let us not forget in this room that the lesson is that you have to pay for the music or you won't get much more of it. And that is critical. And, I, and I'm all for making it fast, easy, and simple to pay, but I have little sympathy for those who use music to draw a crowd, sell sugar water, and then expect not to pay for it. Okay, that's it, I've been cut off. That was fun. I love being with that. Thank you. Oh, it's fun. It was fun. You were great. We all had fun.